Greetings, Earthlings. This is another episode of Ask Me Anything, where you get to write in and ask me questions about whatever you want to ask me about. If you haven't done so already, please press the subscribe button, because then I know somebody out there in the universe is listening to this show. And if you want to ask me a question, click the link in the show notes, and it will direct you to the contact form where you can ask me a question about whatever you want. So, without any more talking about this thing, let's go. Question number one is, I would love to hear your experience with scaling the deliverance of maximum good. It has to be rewarding. So for me, this sort of concept is something that I really try to live by both in my personal life and business life, which happens to be the same thing oftentimes. But the whole concept behind delivering maximum good at scale is, you know, as you grow your business, there's certain things that you don't have to do, but you should do, like take care of your employees and be empathetic and listen to them. It's about the supply chain and making sure that everybody in that supply chain is is doing good things. For instance, at Barnana with the plantain chips specifically, we go to the Amazon and help these communities, these indigenous communities in the Amazon rainforest have better lives and, and bring economic prosperity and, and grow their businesses uh, as we grow ours. And is it the easiest thing to do? No. Is there a cheaper way to do it? Yes. And, you know, it, it sort of runs counter to the straight capitalism that you may think about when you're you're thinking of startups or businesses or corporations or things of that nature. And the, the, the real answer to this question is you don't have to do the easiest thing all the time. And oftentimes the thing that is spreading the maximum amount of good is actually a very hard thing to do. And just, I don't know, my personal feelings about the whole thing is just like do and put out as much good into the universe and into people and, and human beings and the earth in general as much as humanly possible. You know, you can think about it as the triple bottom line, people, profit and planet and not have having any one of those things being mutually exclusive. Like, you can have all three and still have a great business and have a great life. And so that is how I do it. And I would actually like to hear what you guys are doing um, in your life and business. So hit that contact button uh, in the show notes and let me know how you think you could deliver maximum good for yourselves. Question number two, we got... Any tips on getting started in boxing or making more money from Dakota Bennett? Okay, tips on getting started in boxing or making more money. So I started boxing when I was 13. And for me, it all started in my backyard. I had a speed bag, and you know, those speed bags, those tiny little things. And you see uh, people just hitting it real quick. And the speed bag was fun. And then I started sparring and doing that whole thing. And then I'd have sort of underground boxing matches with my friends and things of that nature. Um, uh, so I wouldn't recommend necessarily going that route. Sometimes we'd go bodies only. So when I was in high school, what we would do is we would go and we'd go into the basement of whoever's parents were out of town and we'd have these little miniature fight clubs. And yeah, oftentimes it involved drinking. And so we would be underage drinking and cracking each other's ribs with our fists with no gloves. Um, and occasionally if we did go uh, body and head, we would put gloves on and, and do that. So it was, um, you know, one of those things where we just like to do it. I think it was a lot of teen angst and, and things of that nature. And then I would go into an actual ring and, and box more uh, strategically, for lack of a better term. And um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend necessarily going that route. To get started boxing, just go to a class. You know, you have to be a little bit careful with boxing in that you have these traditional boxing gyms and sometimes there's a lot of ego in boxing gyms. It's very different than something like jujitsu. There's in boxing gyms, oftentimes you'll find guys that just want to kind of rip your head off. And so you may get in there and, and you may be doing pretty good. And then someone will go and they'll, they'll honey dick you. And what they'll say is, oh, hey, man, you're looking pretty good. Um, you know, you should get in there and uh, spar with homeboy over here. You know, your boxing's looking crisp. They're going to blow you up. Oh, yeah, your technique looks so great. Oh, yeah, go and spar this guy. Meanwhile, this guy has 30 amateur fights or something and is just murking dudes. And then you get in there and get your head popped off. So no reason to take additional brain trauma unless you're trying to become a professional boxer or martial artist, fighter of some kind, 
I wouldn't recommend getting any sort of repetitive head trauma into your life if you can prevent it from happening. Therefore, I would recommend something like jujitsu if you really want to spar hard with someone because there's less risk of getting seriously injured. And to get started, yeah, maybe you just start with one of those boxer size type classes. You go in, it's like a cardio boxing thing. You get to hit a bag, get to hit some mitts, you get a get a good weight lift in and cardio exercise in. I would recommend getting started with that and just see how you feel. And I guess this is actually two questions wrapped into one question. Um, Making more money. Making more money. Well, there's a million different ways that you can make money. I don't know what you do. I don't know what you don't do. Um, You know, I would say first, like, optimize the time that you currently have. So you you have to be doing something to make money already, whether that's working at Subway like I used to do or selling cable door to door, which I also used to do or branding cattle like I also used to do. I used to do a ton of of jobs that are not not great jobs. They're they're fine. I mean, you you make money. But if you want to do something more or make more money, you have time after whatever you're doing. Is that working a second job? Is that starting a side hustle? Is it going and and starting an e-commerce site. One easy way to do it, and there's links to these in the show notes, is to start a Shopify site. You can do it relatively inexpensively, and then also start a clothing or apparel site. And there's a thing called the Printful. There's another link in the description here. And what you can do is design a t-shirt or a hat or a beanie or whatever you want. You can connect it to your Shopify store and you can have people buy that. You don't carry any inventory. So there's no money out of your pocket, but basically it's a direct to garment printing process where you put a design on your website. Somebody clicks it, says, I want to buy that. And then that automatically sends all the information to the Printful and they will print and ship your shirt or hat or whatever it is to your end customer and you don't have to spend any money in holding a bunch of t-shirts in your house or something like that and trying to ship them and all those sorts of things. That's one of many ways to do it. You can start a blog, a content site. You can start all kinds of things. Um, Moreover, I would say if you have extra time in the day, sit down and write down 10, 20, 50 different ideas of how you could make extra money and then start prioritizing those say, okay, well, this is the tier one ideas, right? These are the tier two ideas, tier three ideas. And then you start crossing some off and you start with tier three. So in tier three ideas, those are the less good ideas. I'll cross that one off. I don't like this. It's going to take too much time. This is going to whatever, whatever, cross, cross, cross. And then maybe you're left with 10 relatively good ideas for monetizing something that you like to do that you also have the skill set to implement and do. And oftentimes those things aren't going to make you money immediately. They might, but they also might not. Um, So I would do that. You also don't want to necessarily, and I don't know what your financial situation is, you don't necessarily want to start doing something that you don't like to do to just to make money. I've done a ton of that stuff. And so, you know, if you got to do it, do it. Um, I've done it. And, you know, I would do it again if I need to. And you should be willing to do the same. But if you can tie the making money into something that you would like to do, that's going to keep you on the path and you're not going to veer off of it very easily. So that is what I would recommend to start making some more dough to stuff inside your wallet. Uh, All righty. This next question is from Jared Habib. Do you mind if I ask where you get your packaging done? So we get our packaging done in, and this is referring to Barnana, Barnana.com, at Barnana on Instagram. Um, shout out to Barnana. This is what I do the majority of my day, every day. So yeah, where do we get our packaging from? You can get it from China. You can also get it from some domestic suppliers. There's a few different ones out there. And do I divulge who they are? Well, maybe I will. Shout out to Yaxon. Shout out to Color Masters. Those are two good packaging manufacturers that I know and trust that you can go and use. One of them is in China. One of them is in the United States. And they both have pros and cons. I'll let you figure it out. Um, I design all the packaging. So that's where the packaging gets designed. But in terms of actually manufacturing it, there's a litany of these companies out there. There's tons of them. I would be sure to say one thing, though. Oftentimes, when you're looking for packaging, this is stand-up pouches, chip packaging, you know, packaging for consumer products, a food or beverage brand. When you're looking for packaging like that, what you're going to run into is a lot of brokers. And you're going to have to suss out. You're going to have to straight up ask these people, hey, do you own a manufacturing facility or do you have a manufacturing facility partner? And there is a major difference in that. So a lot of these U.S. packaging companies are actually just brokers. So they're using a manufacturing facility 
probably in China somewhere or somewhere else uh, in the U.S., and they're just taking a cut. They're taking 5, 10, 15 percent, whatever they're taking, and making your end cost higher. So make sure you know the difference between a broker and an actual packaging manufacturer. Suss that out early, and you'll find a ton of them on the internet. Next question, how has your journey been as a marketing professional? And this is from a student at San Diego State University, my alma mater. Um, marketing professional. Well, that's a interesting thing to call myself. I don't really think of myself uh, in those terms, but I do do a lot of marketing and I'm technically the chief marketing officer of my startup. So I will talk a little bit about my quote unquote journey as a marketing professional. So I started off in college. I was doing all kinds of stuff. Um, I was designing a lot of packaging, websites, just freelance, doing the thing, really trying to hustle, you know, get, get my hustle on, right? And this is in my early, early 20s, late teens, early 20s. Um, I ended up making an agency. We called it Candy Lab. It was actually La Jolla SEM before that. And so we were doing a lot of small jobs. Um, I did a website for Darren Sproles, the NFL player. I think I was 21, 20 or 21 when I did that one. Um, and and, and so, you know, it was really just going out and, and hustling. And so I really started doing that. I started off on the creative side while also running the business itself. The agency grew. We hired people, uh, offloaded some of that work um, and, and grew the business. Of course, we then uh, turned that into an augmented reality platform, et cetera. And yeah, that's really where it all kicked off. Uh, since then, of course, I co-founded Barnana and really has been doing um, very well. You know, we are in thousands of retailers and the rest of it. And, um, you know, marketing now is such a, a crazier thing, right? I mean, you're doing massive ad campaigns. You're spending hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars on various sorts of programs. And so the journey has been crazy. You know, if you're just starting out, um, and it depends. if you, Are you at a startup? Or are you at a giant corporation? Either scenario, you're going to learn a ton of stuff. At a startup, you're going to learn how to be scrappy to do a lot of guerrilla marketing and growth hacking and really make every single cent work for you. And, and that's the majority of, of my career. And that's uh, a lot of what I've done. So a lot of crazy guerrilla marketing stunts, whether it's flying a blimp, it's um, taking a giant blow up banana and throwing it in the ocean during a swim race, uh, all kinds of crazy stuff, um, all the way to doing more traditional ad campaigns. So the biggest thing here is just wherever you're at, you know, if you're at Coca-Cola, they're going to have a ton of really well-crafted marketing professionals that you can learn from. Uh, take all of those things, take notes, write them down. I would almost teach, I would almost treat it like this is an extension of your education, whether you only have a high school diploma, bachelor's degree, master's, doesn't matter. Uh, but I would use it completely as a learning. I would make a folder on my desktop called Toolbox. I would take every single tool that I get from that company. I would put it in the toolbox. I would take notes, put that in the toolbox. So that way, the next step you take in your marketing career, you have that toolbox to pull from. Um, so yeah, that's how I would recommend that you do it. And that has been my journey thus far. Next question. How do you weigh innovation versus conventional marketing strategies? And how do you balance them from Pete? Well, Pete, uh, the balance is rough. So innovation, in my opinion, in the startup space, and in, even if you're not in a startup, if you are Coca-Cola, Kraft, etc., you're going to have to be innovating all the time because the market's going to innovate with or without you. And what you don't want to do is just say, oh, you know what, I'm just going to do my conventional marketing strategy and just hope that that pays off long term because you're going to get out innovated. You have to innovate or die, in my opinion. And if you're not innovating, you're going to fall on your face at some point. Somebody's going to come along and you see this all over the place. You see it in sports, right? Like if you're not innovating your game and you're, and you're not constantly striving to do new and innovative and awesome stuff, you're gonna you're gonna get passed up. Um, that's not to say you shouldn't do more conventional marketing things either. You're also gonna have to do that, especially when you start to scale, because if nobody knows about your brand, then nobody's gonna buy it. So you do have to invest in traditional things like awareness, and whether that's a billboard or digital ads or social, you're gonna have to do that too. 
Next question from Mary. What is one of your most innovative marketing initiatives? So one of the most innovative marketing initiatives that I ever came up with was a thing called Gorilla Milk. Um, So you can go to GorillaMilk.org right now and check it out. Basically, the idea was, so this is actually a perfect question right after the innovation question. So this was a year in which we weren't going to release a new innovation at Expo West at Barnana. And so we were thinking, okay, so normally the big marketing push at Expo West is, hey, this is our new innovation. Check it out. Come try it. You know, do a lot of marketing around that. And since we didn't have that, I was thinking, well, what can we do that will also generate a bunch of buzz at the show? So I came up with a concept called Gorilla Milk, uh, an unpasteurized, raw, grass-fed milk from the teat of a mother eastern lowland gorilla. And um, so this was all like a really crazy stunt. I ended up drafting a press release talking about how we went to Africa and milked gorillas ourselves with our own two hands and made this milk and we're going to take all the proceeds and give it to conserving gorilla habitats and all this stuff. Um, Made a website. uh, We pushed it to all the press, the trade and everything. Um, and everybody's like, what is going on? We posted it on social. People are like, are you serious? And there was about 25% of people that were just angry vegans, uh, 25% of people that were just calling bullshit, and then 50% of people that were in the WTF uh, category of thinking, they're, what, is this real? Like, what? what's going on? And so by the time Expo West rolled around. We had a a launch day. Hey, everybody come to the booth at this time. We're going to be sampling this new Gorilla Milk, you know, first primate milk ever on the market. Everybody came. And the whole idea was to use this as a PSA that just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. Just because you can milk a gorilla doesn't mean that you should. Just because you can use bad ingredients in your products doesn't mean that you should. Just because you can pay low-wage workers or get conflict ingredients doesn't doesn't mean that you should. And that was sort of a, a statement piece saying like, this is not what we do. We're a socially and, and environmentally conscious company and you should be too. And um, so that was a pretty wild marketing initiative. There's a litany of them that I have done, but um, that is a pretty fun one to talk about. So uh, Gorilla Milk, yes, it's uh, it's not real, uh, but, but it was very fun and, and it was very effective too. And it was very cheap. And um, yeah, uh, always keep that in mind. You know, the, the sometimes the best things that you can do are the cheap things that get a lot of eyeballs, and that was certainly one of them. Uh, next question, how important is software for a marketing team, and what are some that you can vouch for from Charles Bohan? So software in my life is everything. Uh, of course, I do some coding. I don't do uh, you know Python or LAMP stack per se, um, but I do some Java and HTML and CSS and, and those sorts of things, um, all of which is to say that I love software. Uh, I, of course, ran a tech company before Barnana, and so software makes everything much easier if you're not good at using software get good at it a lot of people have this mental block where it's like oh i don't do that i don't understand software and guess what software is the present already and will be even more so in the future so get used to it we use a ton of them. I use a ton of them. Everything from project management software, note-taking software. There's a ton of good ones out there. I can vouch for a, uh, a software called Slack, which reduces the amount of emails that you have between team members. It's basically like a company chat room. Um, I would I use that one just so much every single day. I don't know what I would do without Slack. Uh, it's also really good for managing remote employees. You can also use Hubstaff if you're using remote employees and you want to track if they're actually working. It can take screenshots. Um, measure their screen activity, uh, things of that nature. You can also use something called Notion. So Notion is a very powerful application. It's essentially a project management software kind of built like a wiki, uh, but it's really interesting. Like it's, it's way more easy to use and customizable than your traditional ones like a Monday or an Asana or a Trello or something of that nature. And, and I actually do like Asana and Trello and Monday for that matter, but I find that Notion for me at least, is super powerful. So I would vouch for that. 
Um, I also have everybody go on to Evernote. Everything should be stored in Evernote or some form of note-taking software. Uh, it also just encourages your employees to write stuff down. Uh, you, you just kind of need it. I would also recommend that you use something like the Microsoft Business Intelligence Services. You, you need something uh, as a dashboard to look at your business. Uh, if you're only on e-com, there's a whole bunch of different ones. Yandex has a free plugin for Shopify, uh, Y-A-N-D-E-X, and that one provides you a really, really nice analytics platform for free. I would also recommend that. Uh, there's a ton of them I could go on and on and on, but the short answer is if you have a problem, you can probably solve it with software, and you probably should. All right. Luke P. asks, what primary marketing channel should young marketing individuals focus on at the beginning to get a holistic view of marketing. This is mostly the AMA marketing show, it looks like. Lots of marketing questions. Okay, so Luke, primary marketing channels a young person should focus on to get a holistic view. Um, you know, the holistic view thing is kind of concerning. I don't know. I mean, it definitely, it's, there's something to be said for taking a holistic view and understanding everything from the top down. Um, however, I would say that oftentimes the best way to understand things from the top down is to get really good at something from the down and then look up. So, you know, if you're young and inexperienced, maybe it's better to be at the bottom of a mountain looking at the peak than it would be to start on the peak and then look down and be like, oh, shit, how do I get down? Um, and so I would I would recommend specializing in at least one really, really important thing, be it email marketing, social media marketing, digital marketing in general, Amazon.com, marketing, AMS, something um, creative, uh, you know, something down the funnel that you can say, I am an expert at this, that'll be the best way to then have access to the more holistic view. Because if you prove your worth in sort of the downstream marketing function, you can then say to your higher up or to your next employer or to your whoever that you're really good at this. And oh, also, you know how it fits into the broader marketing mix. Uh, maybe one of the best ways is to sit down with a mentor, even though I don't really believe in mentors and I've never had one. Um, I know that some people do use that, those for that thing. Um, so I wouldn't say that I would recommend it, but I do know that it works for some people. I would also say if you're working at a big corporation or you have the desire or um, you would do it, if you could do it, go do that. There's a ton of great mentors there. You, you get a very, very holistic view if you're working for somebody like a craft. You know, you're going to see their Super Bowl ads or your whatevers. Um, and, you know, it, it's going to be a little harder to get the access to the data at the very top. But at least you'll have an idea. If you're going into startup land, you're going to get a very holistic view right away. But if it's a startup, they're also not going to be doing all of the things that a big company would do. So I would recommend, again, specializing in one to three key areas and getting really, really good at those because that's going to open you up to having access to a more holistic view of marketing. <sighs> Oh, man, I just tore through those questions. All right. Well, that's all I got to say. If you have not subscribed to this show, do it right now please. Um, I would really appreciate it if you do. And uh, also, if you do like it or find it interesting and you want to share it with five of your friends, that'd be cool. Uh, or if you want to, and or if you want to put a five-star review on this thing uh, and write it, that would be dope as well. Thank you so much for listening. If you have a question for me, don't forget to click the link in the show notes or hit me up on the gram at Ingersoll, N-I-K-I-N-G-E-R-S-O-L-L-N-I-K and ask me anything you want. I will be sure to answer it. And until next time, I will chat y'all then. Peace.